Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of The Monsters Den. We've got in the co-captain's chair today, as announced, Mr. Dan Brown. What's up, Dan? Hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm fine. I'm fine. Sitting here. It's good to be back. Yeah. Uh, the warehouse you know, these days. Warehouse is good, man. We're getting busier. I mean, the, the general buzz around the world that I know of and the world that I, am, I hang out in uh, is that come April, it's going to get nuts out there. I mean, I'm seeing a rise in business and hey, long, long time coming. Yeah. So even though I'm a little bit older, maybe wiser, I don't know. Uh, it's going to be challenging, but actually after sitting on my derriere for the last <laughs> two years, years uh, yeah. it's, it's <clears throat> going to be exciting. So yeah, it's good. It's very, very cool. Very cool. I'll, I'll be stopping by soon. I mean, I, I don't think I've been to the warehouse in the, probably about a month, but I've been there quite a few times in yeah. recent months. So, uh, yeah. Right. So. All right. You made a, you made a few times. Don't you worry. You, you're, mm -hmm. I, I keep track of you. Don't worry. You're okay. good. Yeah, you know when I'm you're there. Still, you're still a there. platinum card holder. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so today's episode, uh, we've actually, we've got Dan for uh, two weeks straight here. And uh, today's episode is all about ranking our five favorite Roger Corman, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, Vincent Price collaborations. So basically, these are the film adaptations of the classic Edgar Allan Poe stories done by Roger Corman and AIP Pictures and um, starring Vincent Price. So but before we get to that, uh, we're going to have uh, Dan kind of talk a little bit about how this came to play and how uh, American International Pictures and Corman started working together and how this whole series kind of came to be in the very early 60s. So I'll let Dan kick us off here. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't happen overnight. And actually the story behind American International Pictures actually was very exciting. I thought it just, just all the facts and how this thing came together. But um, back in 1955, a gentleman by the name of Samuel Z. Arkoff, who was an entertainment lawyer, and James H. Nicholson, P.S., no relation to Jack Nicholson, who was the sales manager for uh, Real Art Films. Now, Real Art made a reputation of re-releasing a lot of the Universal Films catalog, in particular, uh, The Monsters, in the early 1950s. And you'll see, if you're familiar with any posters uh, from that era, that there are things called a Real Art re-release. And they spearheaded this. So they wanted to create a company uh, that would specialize in drive-in fare, movies for drive-ins, simple, fast, and effective. And in 1955, they created a company called American Releasing Corporation. Now, the first film that they distribute, or at least the first domestic film they distribute, is a small mo a car movie uh, made by a film company called Palo Alto Productions which happened to be owned by one Roger Corman, who also wrote and produced the film. It did not star him, though. Um, he brought it to their attention, and he cut a deal with Art Corman. I mean, he sat there and said, look, I will deliver you a finished in-the-can product of distribution uh, if you, in fact, will pay me for it when I bring it in, like a COD. I will take that money, and I will roll it back in to another film. And they kind of became an agreement because it must have worked because during 1955, uh, Corman had his hands, I'd like to say there were 10 films distributed and released by uh, American Releasing Corporation, maybe more, but Corman had, Corman had his hand on 75% of the product that came through those doors. And however, by 1956, they changed their name to American International Pictures. And it was at this time that they kind of were the kings of the drive-in theater film. Uh, they made films fast, effective, and cheap with um, in black and white double features in which they can control the, the main event, which got, got a piece of the box office. And then the B film, they got a flat rate of $25. Now, considering there were up, upwards to 4,000 drive-in theaters, this was a niche market to dig into. Oh, yeah. Now, for the next three years, they kind of rule the roost. They don't rule or own the, the drive-ins, mm -hmm. but they control a lot of product that goes through. But by 1959, uh, things started getting a little soft. Now, all the while, mind you, Corman has been helping them produce product. They have a great business relationship. But come 1959, a couple of things are happening. Aside from the raise in costs of, of production on films, uh, secondly, many of their competitors started making black and white fare in double features to sell to the drive-in theaters. And that cut into their business. But the, one of the 
the biggest things that really affected them was by, although in 1949, when television first kind of trickling in, it was nipping at the heels of the movie business. By 1959, it was taking big chunks out of its ankle. So they decided at this point to pull back and not make any American productions. And they specialize in bringing imported films in. And one of the, aside from a couple of Herculean, as they call peplum films, uh, a film they did bring to the shores here and they did very well with was an Italian horror film starring a British actress by the name of Barbara Steele. And that film was called Black Sunday. And they distributed it, they released it, and they did fairly well with it. But by the end of 15 or sometime during 1959, Okay, Roger Corman approaches them again and says, look, instead of making two black and white features, let me spend that much money on making a color film in which he wanted to specialize in the films of Edgar Allan Poe. Main reasons Roger Corman was a fan of Edgar Allan Poe. Secondly, he didn't have to pay a writer for the book because they're a public domain. Yeah. Um, and thirdly, uh, something I'm not sure that it would be... Um, it was, he never admits it was, this is a situation for it, but I believe that with the success of Hammer films being released in America, in color, and lavish looking productions, although on a very, very tight budget, he felt that this was the time for the American business to do this. And this is what they did, and they settled in on Poe. They went out, they obtained the services of Vincent Price, who at that point had 20 years under his belt as an actor, but he only dipped his, his toe into the horror genre only a few times. But most recently, right before the House of Usher went into production, he had already starred in two rather successful B, drive-in, uh, Saturday afternoon matinee films. One was called The Tingler, and the second was called House on Haunted Hill. They were done by that impresario, uh, William Castle, who in turn actually, as a little side note, was kind of portrayed uh, by John Goodman in a film called Matinee. Uh, so they went to this direction, got uh, Vincent Price, started production on House of the Usher, and that is where we stand today. And that's why we're getting together to talk about this, because this created a thing called the Roger Corman Poe cycle. There we go. That's right. And I do want to just mention real quick, because uh, Dan brought up a lot of really good points there, um, about the whole hammer movement that was going on in the 60s of these kind of gothic horror films you know aip in most of the 50s was really uh kind of focused on more of like your sci-fi drive-in fair i mean you, you said it perfectly there and i just i wanted to just read off some titles and just so people can kind of get an idea for what aip or what films they were working on it conquered the world the she creature uh voodoo woman I was a teenage werewolf, invasion of the saucer men, naked Africa, uh, motorcycle gang, sorority girl, the amazing colossal man, cat girl. I was a teenage Frankenstein, blood of Dracula, the astounding she monster. I could go on and on and on here, but a lot of a lot of cheese. Right. But that's what was all the rage at the time. So, uh, yeah. So now we've arrived into the early 60s. So we've got uh, Corman, AIP working together. They've got Vincent Price and we've got a whole bunch of films. There are eight in total. So Dan and I are actually going to pick our favorite five out of these. And we'll probably mention the ones that don't get picked at the end. But I'll have Dan kick us off with uh, number five. OK, number five. I actually wrote down eight, from eight down. So let me find where number five is now. Five, five. Oh, okay. So number five, we're going to look at the Haunted Palace. Uh, that was uh, 1964, I believe. And that is, yep, there you go. Which is in reality. This set has a good chunk of them right here, by the way. This is the uh, Vincent Price yeah, collection. There's three of them. I have all of them. But yeah, but all most of the, not all of them, but most of the Poe films are on this particular set. The thing, the thing about this film is that, and look, yeah, I even brought my arrow. Look at this. Oh, there's the arrow. Nice. Yeah, which I bought at one of their umpteen sales. Thank God I have a uh, Region 2 player. So that's what it was. I could, you know, sat there and read the liner notes, which are always entertaining in arrow video. But anyhow, The Haunted Palace, it really isn't, a, it isn't, a, um, it isn't an Edgar Allan Poe story. It's actually based on an H.B. Lovecraft story called The Case of Charles Dexter Ward. Yeah. Um, and it's actually well done. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it's about a fellow who um, his ancestor is burned at the stake 
as a warlock, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it's Vincent Price, of course. And then his great, 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 great grandson or whatever, uh, once again, played by Vincent Price, comes back to the house. And the best way to sum it up is it, it he starts being possessed by the evil spirit of his warlock ancestor, mm -hmm. uh, which makes this film a lot of fun. It's, it's, just, it's got a really great atmosphere. It does capture, surprisingly on a set with the, with the budget they do, it does capture um, the mood of a H.P. Lovecraft, uh, you know, picture taking place on the Northeast coast. Uh, secondly, it's also one of the more substantial roles for um, Lon Chaney Jr. at this time. Uh, yeah. who at this time was making a couple of Westerns here and there, some TV appearances, but this was probably his last substantial role. And he plays it off pretty well. And obviously they kept Lon sober during the day because he looks pretty good. He does. In yeah, he film. does. <laughs> and he's intimidating. Yeah. And, um, and then finally, of course, uh, you've got the services of Vincent Price, who's an astounding job of actually playing the split personality yeah. thing but his ancestor and his normal self. And uh, yeah, that's number that's number five for me. Yeah, it's a great choice. Uh, more about that in a little bit. But um, I, I also agree Cheney's really good here. And probably his next to like maybe Spider Baby, probably his one of his great mm -hmm. latter period roles, I would think. Um, and yeah, really tour de force for Price playing both the great grandfather and then the grand great grandson and the whole like kind of battle as he's being taken over by the spirit. And, and ironically enough, even Cheney's role in this film is kind of like questionable because is he also a warlock that's a hundred and something years old that has lived in the cabin? I mean, that's basically my perception of it um, because he obviously once uh, Price's grandson, you know, the great, the great grandson starts to get taken over by the spirit of his great grandfather. It's almost like a, a reunion between the two because mm -hmm. Cheney's role, he was the servant back a hundred years ago. Uh, and now it's like, welcome back, you know, master type of thing. So really, really cool, another, cool film. There's another guy also on the trail. Yes. Too. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember what actor that is. But yeah, that's true. He could he could very well be like stuck at the house, you know, being a being ghost or 300 years old himself. Yeah. You never So yeah. I, I enjoyed that film and I like the atmosphere. Yeah, Great deal. Really good. And I will say, you know, when Dan and I talked about doing this show, we had already seen these films many, many times. But and for me, uh, it had been a few years since I've watched a, a couple of these. And it's always really nice to revisit some of these, these old films. And uh, they just get better with age, I think. So my number five, I've actually, my list has changed a little bit over the last couple of days. I keep kind of moving things around. <laughs> and this originally was not in my top five, but then I rewatched it again uh, last weekend. And I'm like, oh, I really, I have a soft spot for anthology films. And uh, Tales of Terror from 1962 is going to be my number five. It's based on three separate tales. Uh, Morella, The Black Cats, which Black Cat's been done a million times, right? But each, every adaptation of The Black Cat is completely different than, than all the others. That's what I think is really cool. And then the last one is the facts in the case of uh, M. Valdemir, Valdemar. And basically you've got Vincent Price who stars in all three of the stories, but you've got Peter Lorre in The Black Cat. You've got uh, Vincent Price and Maggie Pierce in Morella. And then you've got uh, Vincent Price and Basil Rathbone in the uh, the facts in the case of M. Valdemar. And what's really cool is that uh, you know Basil Rathbone, get, who's was fairly you know was pretty elderly at the time when he did this particular film, uh, plays the the kind of the bad guy, the evil character in that particular uh, story, where he comes up with this way to kind of um, put uh, someone in like a death state but can kind of control them for an extended period of time. And that person is actually uh, Vincent Price in this particular story. Uh, the black cat, Peter Lorre, just like chews up the scenery, playing like an old nasty drunk who's got this really attractive young wife who he just mistreats, steals all the money she makes from him. He doesn't work. He takes all the money, goes out and drinks and whatever. And she winds up meeting. I mean, there's, there's a scene, I don't want to get the whole story away, but there's a scene where he's at a bar and he meets up with this younger guy who's Vincent Price, who is like a wine critique, right? And they get into this competition uh, about you know, who can, by tasting a wine, can tell the vintage and the style of wine and all that sort of thing. So there's this whole scene where the two of them are going head to head in a bar in front of all these people tasting all these bottles of wine, getting completely hammered. Well, long story short, 
uh, Price's character winds up taking Peter Laurie home because he's stumbling drunk and he meets the young wife. They start up an affair. And then, of course, you know, there is a black cat that the wife owns. And then uh, Laurie eventually finds out about the affair. So he has concocts this whole scheme of uh, drugging their, you know, inviting the guy over and drugging their wine and imprisoning both of them alive behind a wall and then brick laying the whole wall up so they die behind the wall type of thing and of course i won't give away the ending because it has to do with the black cat but a really really great story and then uh morella is another really kind of just lurid story about uh, vincent price character whose uh wife dies in childbirth and he keeps her her corpse laying around all these years and blames the daughter for the death of his wife and the daughter comes back after many years and this it's a crazy crazy story and i i think all three of them work really really well here and the acting is superb and uh, so that's my number five tales of terror yeah, they that actually that whole imprisoning scene with the whole wine is also part of the cask of the Amontillado, which is another Poe story on its own. So they tap they, they would tap into numerous Poe stories or ideas. I mean, then they took a great deal of liberties with these things. I mean, sometimes oh, yeah. they're literally nothing to do with Poe, and I'll discuss one later. It's not even on the list. Any of these lists, um, yeah, and that's and that's why the whole thing we were doing about this I must have mentioned earlier the 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 black cat or the the initial story with peter laurie okay this was an inspiration for another film to come up later uh, by corman but apparently somewhere along the line um laurie and vincent price had a great deal of chemistry because they filmed an unsold pilot film called the left fist of david in which they played a globe trotting uh, investigators of stolen art and they had a certain chemistry. And I guess that had a lot to do with uh, them going into, and I think you could find um, the, the uh, Left Fist of David uh, on like YouTube or something. It's an old public domain show, but it's an interesting concept. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a well done film. Uh, it kept a lot of these older actors employed, <laughs> to be honest with you. And, um, and of course you got Vincent Price. And once again, his portrayal in each, three, each film is a separate performance. He's a different yeah. character in damn near every one of them. Yeah. But I am starting to notice that, yes, he embraces the mad pretty easily when he does stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a good point, because I think in the first story in Tales of Terror, he kind of plays like a um, not really good guy, right? And then in the second film, he plays more of a comedy role, but he's also kind of like a sleazeball, right? Not, not oh, yeah. much evil, but kind of a sleazeball. And then in the third film, he plays the victim. And plays very well and, and and you root for him in that one right so yeah mm -hmm. three completely different uh roles which is which is great okay back to I you, guess you need my number four okay well number four um is another poe adaptation but it doesn't star vincent price and this is called premature burial and premature burial is about a fellow uh, played by ray Land, yeah who is had great fear of being buried alive. And somewhere along the line, it happens, you know, this, without giving too much away. It's an interesting film because very much along the line of his earlier films, there's a lot of psychedelic coloring and, and hazy hallucinations and walking about. It's very wild. And the reason why Raymond Land is in this film is because that Corman was having a, um, although they had had a great arrangement with Arkoff and, and Nicholson for years, uh, all of a sudden when the Paul, of the Paul of the House of the Usher was put out and uh, what do you call it? The second one, which was uh, The Pit and the Pendulum, okay? He was starting to question his, let's say profits on the back end or his sharing, his profit sharing. And he said, screw it, he was out. And he went and approached a company called Pathé and Pathé was going to produce and to get into this game, uh, premature burial. Well, the thing is, A, they could not get Vincent Price because he was under a contract with American International Pictures. And then secondly, as the story goes, just to make it even more juicy, is apparently that when Arkoff found out this was going on, they went over and there are two stories that are given. One that they kind of strong-armed strong -armed Pathé um, about, no, give us this film back or you'll never We'll never buy another movie from you again to distribute. And they were still pretty powerful. The second one is, is they went out and bought the company. 
out from under them or from them. And he went up, they went up to Corman. Even Corman says this. They walked up and said, well, it's going to be nice working with you again because we just brought the company. And that's how it works. And that's how Raymond Land got it. But Raymond, Raymond Land actually breaks up that whole eight film cycle. And he's had some, he had some great roles in some AIP films. And he was a good, he was a great actor in general. Yeah. And, uh, but it, it, it's a lot of fun. That film, I, I did. I really enjoyed that. And a, a really good acting job by, um, oh, what is her name? Hazel Court in this film. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are fans of Hammer, you obviously know the name Hazel Court. She appears in a couple of these films we're going to talk about today. And uh, I don't want to give anything away, um, but she is. Uh, she plays within the film. She probably portrays a couple of different uh, different roles. Same character. I'll leave it at that because right Dan because I don't think I can say too much. Yep. No, I can't say much. You gotta give you gotta you know you gotta gotta whet their appetites out there. Yeah, gotta whet their appetite. But a, a really fun film. It just it didn't make my my top five, um, but I enjoy it a lot. And I think it's really atmospheric, really well done. Uh and you know what's funny, it's like watching the film, you know, all these years later again. A part of me was sitting there saying, Well, well, how would this film would have been if Vincent Price was in the lead role? because that probably was the original idea, right? And that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But I think Ray Milan does a really good job and he is a little bit older, which, you know, maybe wasn't the right choice from a age perspective, but I thought he did a great job and uh, you can feel kind of his pain because he's obviously wrestling with all sorts of stuff going on and, you know, in his head and, and uh, all throughout the film and yeah. And I, I, you know, this whole notion of catalepsy you know, comes up a few times in these stories, which is interesting. And you don't really hear about that all too often where, you know, someone can appear in this state of death, but they're very much still alive, you know, very strange. And that, that was a major fear during the Victorian times when they made, when they wrote, when they, when Poe was writing these stories, there was a fear of being buried alive because of such things. Yeah. And that's why in some cemeteries, they used to have actually a string going through the ground, through a tube into the casket. And that's how they got night watchmen and Western because they'd have to listen if the person woke up and they weren't dead, they'd ring the bell. And the guy would have to go out and dig them up. Imagine so, being the guy who hears that. <laughs> like, oh, shit. Uh, uh, <laughs> know, that's your job. What do you do? I listen to uh, the bell. No, thanks. You know? no thanks. That was a big fear of many, you know, many, many people in that time. You know, we've we've advanced very far. We can pretty much figure out when somebody's dead now. So yeah, that's now, now, yeah, definitely. But yeah, now, when you're a guy, don't, don't waste the money on the belt. No, not even. Yeah, you could probably call. Actually, put a put a cell phone in the casket. Now they'll call us. But that's what you do now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, right. Uh, hello. Um, I don't know what the hell you did, but I'm still living and breathing down here, and I can't see shit. And get me out of here. Now you understand why I said, "Don't embalm me. Don't embalm me." You know, <laughs> so, sinking in, ain't it, buddy? So uh, crazy stuff. All right, my number four, we're going to go to 1964, uh, Mask of the Red Death. That's uh, it right there in this collection. So, you know, another very gothic Victorian type of uh, production here. I think, uh, you know, Vincent Price play, play, plays this uh, wealthy prince. Uh, what is his name, actually? He's got a pretty interesting name. Um, prince, oh, God. Prospero. 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 Yeah. They call him Prospero throughout the whole movie. Uh, he's got a lot of money. He's got this big castle. He's also a Satanist, right? And he kind of presides over this plague-stricken uh, pagan or peasant village, right? And who are, they're going through really rough times. And he's here having the time of his life. You know, he's got all this money. He's a great place. He invites all the wealthy people and has all these parties, all this kind of stuff. He even, uh, you know, he kind of in, in his own way terrorizes people of the town. And he winds up like inviting into the castle these uh, these two men and uh, a young girl. And the one is the father of the girl. The other is like the boyfriend or their husband, something like that. I think it's the boyfriend actually. And, uh, and actually Jane Asher plays the young girl, yes. Jane Asher pre Paul McCartney days. Right. So she was actually an aspiring actress and she actually met Paul McCartney. Not that long after this, I don't think. Yeah, either. I, Roger Corman says that, but then again, Roger Corman, you know, since he's like, he's like, you know, 112 and, there's nobody left alive. I mean, you can make your own history, but he said that who's going to fight you over this? Uh, and I think it was something along the lines. He said that she was starting to date Paul McCartney because they filmed that in England. And he was, she was just starting to date Paul McCartney. He met Paul McCartney in a 
like a little coffee shop. Okay. That day. Then it went on from there. But it was around, if anything, it was around that time. It had to have been, right? Because, I mean, the Beatles yeah. in 64 were already, you know, they were already a uh, band in the North. So, yeah, could be. Um, also in this movie uh, stars Hazel Court, once again, who Hazel Court plays like one of... Uh, Vincent Price's character, Prince Prospero, one of his inner circle, but she wants to be his lady, right? She wants to be the right-hand gal with him. And Vincent Price's character starts to take a real interest in Jane Asher's character. So it's really interesting to see the kind of the friction between Hazel Court and Jane Asher in here. Uh, and in fact, uh, Hazel Court has a uh, couple of really interesting scenes in this film. Uh, one of which was she's running around and then you can really see it on Blu-ray in like a sheer negligee, right? And so if, you, if you're if you a Hammer fan, you've always wanted to see a little bit more skin from Hazel Court, this is the <laughs> film for you. Um, and again, the, the, the whole climax of the film, he has this gigantic party with all like the rich people from the surrounding areas and, and stuff. And of course you got all the people dying of the, the red death, the plague from the outside. And then you got the red death character shows up. There's a great death scene at the end. The whole climax is really good. Uh, and it's uh, it's not one of my favorite films in this, in this series, but it definitely has an impact. And it, it's, it could be one of Price's best roles because I think he really, is great at playing like an evil scumbag and he does it really well in this. So uh, yeah, that's a good, good cast, really good cast, really well shot, very colorful film, really, really nice colors on this film. So uh, yeah, that's my number four. Nice. All right. Number three, what do I do with this? Oh yes. Let's go with house of the usher. The first film that launched it all off. Oh, I can show my arrow too. How exciting is this? There. Oh, the house of usher. Yep. There you go. And um, Price is a blonde. Yeah. As a blonde. Well, I, I was said, you know, it's so funny. When you when you when you said we're gonna do a, a you know this this segment, and I said to myself, I said, wow, you got Vincent Price, you got American International Pictures, um, and with Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe, and you've got drive-ins. And I have to admit, without showing my age, I saw a couple of these and many other films. I was a big drive-in goer as a child. Not me, I wasn't driving. It was like I was five years old. But I would go with my parents like tw at least twice a month. And the, I saw these things on the, some of these I saw on the big screen. And I was little at the time, but I do remember certain segments of it, like the, the pendulum or something that may have happened in, in the house of the usher and so forth. But it, there was something you know to be said about seeing them in their element. Yeah. Like, you know, instead of watching it. And it was a lot of fun. It was the whole energy of the drive in theater from anything from the wrinkled hot dogs to the playground to the ladies in the snack bar. They were just too angry to be lunch lady. So they were, and, you know, but it was a lot. It was it, it was a lot of fun. And it really, you know, but anyhow, getting back to the house of the usher. Um, once again, is he plays the blonde, as you said. And the funny thing about um the blonde, when he first opens the door and he comes out leering like a demented maniac, the first thing that crossed my mind was the guy Criswell from the from the Ed Wood movies who would predict the future. You know, because he has this like Troy Donahue, you know, yeah. blonde hair. And the whole story is basically about this house. And you kind of find out as time goes on, you know, that really the house is the manifestation of evil. Yeah. And that yeah. Roderick Usher is really slowly being driven mad by it as as was his ancestors yeah. and uh, even the surrounding grounds around it are devastated and there's an interesting bit of trivia about that in the beginning of the film uh when the hero of the film uh by the name of mark um oh God, mark, damon. Is, damon. mark damon he was kind of like a teenage idol type of thing yeah um, as he's riding towards the castle He's riding through this rather burned out landscape and there's smoke billowing up from the ground and there's just charred you know, trees. And you're saying, God, what a set. But apparently Corman was notified that there was a brush fire in just north of Hollywood or a wildfire. And he just grabbed the camera crew <laughs> and they used this burned out area to give this impression of like this, this house that's sucking the life out of the grounds around and everything it. around it yep yeah everything around it and um not giving away what happens but yes it's a uh, well done first time it's probably the most mature of the three films i think he really doesn't play it play it up to the kids 
Uh, he does. I'm not saying all the play with the kids, but there's it's a pretty much of a straightforward uh, house story of madness. No comic relief. No, you know, uh, no tongue in cheek. And he, he stays pretty close to the original story of Washington, which is a film that's been done countless times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But that's it. House of the Usher. Yeah, and I think it's a uh, it, it's a I, I, the chemistry between uh, Vincent Price's character and his sister in the film, who's played mm-hmm. by uh, Myrna Fahey, uh, really really well done. And she's tortured because she knows the family history. She knows what she's in store for, but she's got this fiance who is the Mark Damon character, and he's like you know love struck guy. I got to get you out of this house, and you know Vincent Price is like you can't take her out of this house. She this is her fate, you know. And then the, the whole thing of catalepsy comes up in the story as well. Well, right. It's just, yeah, really, really well done. And uh, and once again, because I got to say this, how many of these films end with a burning house or castle? <laughs> it's like the conclu- the epic conclusion of every film has got to have a fire. And, and one of the on the uh, one of the Blu-rays, I don't remember which film it is in the Screen Factory set. Uh, there's an interview with Roger Corman and he laughs saying, yeah, and we have to throw in another big fire because that's kind of what we did. It's just like almost every single one of these stories ends in a fire. It's like that's that's the way to just kind of like. Well, and the and they use the same footage. Yeah. That they use the stock footage from Usher. I think at the end of the Raven, it's the, it's the Usher house. Everything is yeah. burning. It's always that same stock footage and they didn't have to, you know. Didn't didn't have to pay. Oh, you know, Dan, you saved twenty thousand dollars. Got to do it, they, right? They, look, they were genius. Well, fire's a fire. It doesn't matter. Oh, so what if it doesn't quite look like a castle? It, it, no right. one will know, it's, right? It's not a castle, right? It's like I remember watching. We, I, I'm I'm mistaken. It was like a movie called Attack of the Fifty Foot Woman. I might be wrong with this, but the monster picks up a truck, a car, and then when he throws it, they have some stock footage of another car. It's a completely different vehicle. <laughs> Roll, you know. <laughs> Like or something or something is weird about it. But then again, attack of the fifty four woman. We're not talking about high production values. No, so, no. And I think the, the colossal, surprised. both colossal man films. I think also use the second film used stuff from the first. It's like you're watching, like, well, wait a second. That's kind of what he looked like in the first film. It's like oh, <laughs> he looks exactly the same. What is this? He has the same suit on. Yeah. It's like we do these two segments today. It's going kind of like, does Dan Brown ever change his clothes or Peter? What do they do? They're wearing the same clothes for a second segment. Yes, yes. we are. So oh, there you go. It's our business. You, know, you just have to listen to us. The secret's awesome. been revealed. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the secret's revealed. Yes, the magic of the movies. That's um, right. So um, speaking of which, with uh, not to add something else, but to add something, if anybody had watched, read Famous Monsters of Filmland uh, as a kid, particularly in the early 60s, there was always a blurb about American international pictures, whether it be Invasion of the Sorcerer or The Beast with a Million Eyes or whatever it was, or Beast from 10,000 Fathoms or any of these films. And there's a reason for it. In the 19, early 1930s, James H. Nicholson, uh, being kind of a sci-fi geek, went to attend uh, a science fiction convention in San Francisco. And he made the acquaintance and the friendship of a guy named Forrest J. Ackerman. So when Forey Ackerman launched uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, which became a Bible for a lot of, quote, monster kids, uh, there was always an AIP thing in there, and that he promoted AIP films heavily. And so that's where, that's why if anyone famous wanted, why was there always a picture of the invasion of the Soul Why? Why not? Why and speaking, not? Yeah. And speaking of which on that, when you mentioned some of the things we have, Invasion of the Soul um, the War of the Colossal Beast, and a number of others, about eight or 10 other films, and why you don't see them here in the US. Now, they were released in Europe on DVD for a very short window, but there's a number of titles that are owned by the widow, who was much younger than him, of James H. Nicholson. And she owns the rights to those films, and that's why you haven't seen them being churned out into Blu-ray, or at least domestically released. Yeah, because like War, War of the Colossal Beast is on Blu-ray, but yet the Colossal the colossal mm-hmm. man is colossal not man, you know, and especially invasion of the saucer man, which is like, why can't that come out? But they did come out uh, in Europe uh, for a very very short, and they came out on VHS here too, strangely enough, yeah. but unless they were on, unless they were on, they were like bootlegs put out by Columbia. We don't know, yeah. and they got pulled from the market. But she controls them, and that's why you don't see them. Okay, that makes sense. All right, my number three, uh, Haunted Palace from nineteen sixty three. Uh, I will echo everything. 
Dan had said before, I think it's a really, really enjoyable film. Uh, one of the, re- we, we didn't touch about on this when, when you were mentioning it before, but one of the cool things about this film that's uh, I think a little ahead of its time and very Lovecraftian is the scene where Price's character as the great grandson comes back mm-hmm. to the village because he inherits the house, obviously. And he's walking, him and his wife are walking around town and he, everybody's acting really weird towards him because they know he's a descendant of the warlock that they killed hundred years ago. But part of the curse that his great grandfather put on the town was on the villagers themselves so you see all these villagers walking around town with all these deformities like these big giant heads and long and short limbs and all this kind of stuff and you know this this movie's from 1963 and to kind of see some of that stuff it was like really chilling you know really ahead of its time because i think you know that whole uh idea of like curses and deformities and things like that you know which is very you know lovecraft a lot of lovecraft stories have that but you didn't really start to see that in films much until later on you know freaks notwithstanding from the 30s obviously but uh but yeah that's that's one of the really cool things about this film that they added yeah yeah i agree yeah. you know some of the makeups look like actually it sounds crazy because you know there was kind of a kind of an inbred relationship of, first off, like Richard Matheson and Charles, well, Richard Matheson wrote the first six scripts for uh, the AIP, Poe films, or at least five or six of them. And uh, Charles Beaumont, they both went off to write for the Twilight Zone, not very often, but they wrote for the Twilight Zone. And it's so funny, one of the makeups of some of the people in the beginning looks like a makeup um, from, I think it's an episode of the Twilight Zone called Eye of the Beholder. And it's a guy with kind of like the pig nose and walk, you know, and it looks very similar to the makeups they use in some of the Twilight Zone episodes, but I've not been able to, you know, prove that or not, just maybe coincidence on that. Yeah, um, yeah pretty cool. Um, good movie. So that's my number three, Haunted Palace. Uh, back to you for number two. Okay, number two, going to go with The Pit and the Pendulum. Uh, probably, uh, probably with uh, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, or should I say Vincent Price at his, at his, Probably even more so than in the Haunted Palace, it is schizophrenic best, just totally mad. And this also, this film also has uh, Barbara Seal in it, playing his wife, which he was probably cast in it uh, after the success of, you know, because Arkoff and, and Nichols were no fools. You know, they made big money with Black Sunday. I don't know if she was given like top, top billing, but she plays Vincent Price's wife. Yeah, and this actually launched her because she was originally cast to play like Elvis Presley's girlfriend in in a western, uh, something like Shining Star. Or what was it called? I can't remember. She was supposed to be cast in that, and you know she was a bit difficult to work. She left, and uh, ended up they had the Black Sunday, and then they brought her in for House of the Usher, and so that might have added to the box office. But once again, he's. Um, at his demented bed, you know, the, the, pen, the pendulum, the, the name of the film itself just sums it up for you. And then here, the end, the pendulum, that's one of those I remember as a kid, the pendulum just swinging. swinging. Back. Yep. <laughs> and for, for some reason or another, it, it rips his shirt at least 15 times before even touching his stomach. Because uh, you see, you know, this is going to be the one. You would think after that one, one rip that he's done, right? That's, that's, that's it. Stomach uh, rips next. It's waiting you know, for the big, the big crescendo. <laughs> And that didn't happen. But anyhow, it, it's a well done film, once again. Um, it wasn't, funny thing about it is Cat, uh, Mask of the Red Death was supposed to be the second film done in this post cycle. But uh, since they had put out the seventh, Vic, uh, seventh Seal by Ingmar Bergman, there's a lot of segments in um, Mask of the Red Death that look like death from that film. Didn't want to take anything away from that or lose anything or be called a copycat. So they did Pit and the Pendulum was proved to be very, very successful. And um, yeah, kind of cemented their their reputation in this drive-in color bombastic, uh, let's do what we want with Poe. Yeah, it's a good one. And I, I think it's also, uh, you know, besides all the kind of the torture stuff. Um, there's the groovy, the groovy oh, arrow box. There you go. It's a really great story about betrayal, right? I mean, yeah. without giving too much away, but mm-hmm. uh, all right, we'll, we'll get more to that in a minute. But uh, my number two is House of Usher um, or the fall of the House of Usher. That's the, the story is the fall of the House of Usher, movies the House of Usher. Uh, and that's 1960. Um, you know, Dan said a lot of great things about it. A great cast. Um, 
really good, a really good story again. It ends in the big, you know, burning castle and, uh, you know, got to end the bloodline and all that sort of stuff. But um, just a really kind of creepy and, you know, Price's character is really interesting in this because he's kind of, he's kind of, he's kind of evil and kind of like, he's also not, he's kind of a coward too, but yet he's so steadfast in his, you know, this is what this family has to go through. There's no way to change the destiny. This is what's going to happen. And he's basically, you know, he, I mean, the, the, a lot of the film is the conflict between him and the fiance of his sister uh, and him trying to get him to understand you just need to leave and let us meet our fate. And that's the way it's got to be. And mm -hmm. uh, really, really good film. I like it a lot. It, you know, could have been my number one, but my number one, I think I just, uh, you know, so back to you for your number one. I think I know what it's going to be. Well, my number one is, is Mask of the Red Death. Yep. And why I like Mask of the Red Death, I find it very frightening, especially at the time when I watched it when I was younger. Um, and I just, I like, you know, well, it's the lavishness of the production. And that's why, you know, both that uh, film and the Tomb of Legia, which was the last film in the post cycle, were filmed in England. And they had gone over very similar. You, we had done a show a long time ago about Amicus Pictures, which was an American company that did films in England uh, because of the tax breaks and tax incentives. And this is why the last two Poe films in the Poe cycle, as in, uh, <coughs> excuse me, The Mask of the Red Death and Tumulogia were done in England. And that's where you see like, wow, real castles, this and that. But the Mask of the Red Death, although they, you don't see many exteriors, seems to be a lot of soundstage stuff. It's not like they filmed in the, in the countryside, uh, but it has an English cast in there. Uh, it's interesting enough. And I thought at first, there's at some point during the film where you, the, people will encounter like the Red Death sitting next to a tree in these surreal moments. And eventually there's like a yellow death, a black death, there's a bunch of these deaths, but he talks. And I swear to God, the first time I heard it, I said, did they get Christopher Lee to do this? Because it sounds just like Christopher Lee. And it, it's, not him. it's not him. It's not him. I figured, I bet you they purposely, knowing Art Coffin Nicholson, I know they probably had somebody come in and audition as the voice of Christopher Lee. So that people would sit and listen to him and go, oh my God, that must be Christopher Lee. The guy's yeah. name is John Westbrook. Right, but he sounds very much like Christopher Lee. He sounds exactly oh, like Christopher Lee. Exactly. Yeah. So I was just saying they never, they you know, and I don't think he's this in the credits of the film. I'm not sure, but nonetheless, I think that was just once again an extreme marketing thing done by American International Pictures. Same as they latched on the name of Poe, which they they milk that to death. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, but Mask of the Red Death, I just like the colors. It also includes also the story of Hop Frog, which is another short of story by uh, Edgar Allan Poe. And I'll give Corman credit on all of these films where he would take bits and pieces of different Poe stories and it's together very well, right? Seamlessly melds them into yeah. making it coherent, kind of like this is Roger Corman's interpretation or Roger Corman slash Richard Matheson or whoever it is, interpretation of Poe. And it and actually it stands out as as a, as as a, as a great homage to Poe and introduced a lot of people to Poe that had not really thought much about him. Yeah, that's a great point because, you know, the fact that he was taking basically content from all these different written sources and putting them together. And in some instances, not really even staying true too true to the sources and adding additional stuff on top. All these films, the, the plot lines is very tight and which not so similar to what he started doing in the 70s and the 80s with all the real kind of cheapy films that he was doing left and right, which made no sense whatsoever. These films are actually really well done and well written, well acted the whole nine yards. So it's uh, interesting how Roger kind of, you know, moved away from that mm -hmm. afterwards and just started, just make pictures to make pictures. And uh, before I move on to my number one pick, uh, John Westbrook, who we talked about as the voice of the Red Death in that film, was uncredited, and he's actually one of the stars of the Tomb of Lygia that Dan was talking about. So it's ah, okay, yeah. there you go. But yeah, total dead ringer for Christopher Lee. I mean, if you, if you just go in and listen to any that that scene that he's in, um, you would do a double take. You're like, wait a second, that's got to be that's, Mr. That Lee. That sounds awfully familiar. Yeah, I know yeah. that voice, and most of us should know that voice, right? Well, no, it's not the voice you're thinking of. No, you know, it's it's funny that well, you're gonna go. Um, 
yeah, it's just it's just pretty wild how how you know this um, and the mask a great one sheet poster. I mean, with the red face, with all yeah. the tattoos and the bodies on it, and you know, and it's it's actually a mature film also because had it been done like fifteen years later, there would have been orgies and debauchery and craziness because this this Prince Prospero is just like a a pervert, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, but well done, I liked it, and I think I, I really like it the best because it is the stylization and probably other than a couple of noir films that, that, that Price was in, in the forties and fifties, um, he plays it just an uber scumbag, excuse my yeah, French. He's, he's really good. Um, uber scumbag and um, didn't care about anybody. So that's why I picked that. Yeah. And I think out of, you know, when, when you, at least me throughout my life, when I think of these films, like when you just think of, okay, the Roger Corman, Vincent Price collaboration films on Edgar Allan Poe, Generally speaking, for me, the images I instantly get in my head are from this film because there are so many striking moments in the film and, you know, especially like the, the, the finale of the film. I mean, it's like so generally speaking, that's the first thing that flashes in my head may not be my favorite, but it's the one to me that's the most kind of memorable. Right. That we take away. And, you know, I grew up. Mm -hmm. You know, you were talking about how you would see some of these films in the drive and for me, it was seeing these films on the weekends on WWOR, WPIX or, you know, Channel 11, Channel 5, the all the syndicated uh, channels that we had in the New York area in the 70s. That's when I caught a lot of these. These would be on all the time. So uh, that's that's, you know, growing up with these was for me it was on TV. I wish I would have seen some of these in the theater, you know, or in the drive in. But they hold up well on the small screen. Yeah, that's, they really do. Yeah. They're, they're fun. They're they're a slice. And, you know, it's one of these situations, you think about it, you sit there and say, okay, Universal had its its horror run in the 30s up to like 35 when you know, they stopped making films in 36. Uh, then you had like, oh, this is a segment. This was the noir period. This, that. Actually, the Roger Corman, the post cycle, how he pulled this all off. And given the history I gave about working for a couple of like skin flints that we're running everything on bare bones, which Roger Corman learned even more how to run a tight budget, thanks to those two. Uh, they in that whole era from nineteen, from all the house, all of the house of the usher, uh, up through the tomb Legia, that five year gap or four and a half five year gap, that is a that's a big chunk of American film history right there. That really is a that's that's a that's a segment unto itself, and as far as the genre or the way it was delivered, etc. Yep. All right. My number one. Spam call. Oh, I'm sorry. Probably yeah. <laughs> Important message. Pick up. Yeah, I know, right? As soon as I got as soon as I got rid of my house phone, that that all. Ended. I like what, I like what they say. Probably spam. What you can't make up your mind. Right. Exactly. I mean, what, yes. What's determining it? Okay. It either is or it isn't. Days, right. <laughs> one of these days, I'm hoping to actually get a call from the company that makes spam, and I'll go. Okay. Finally, this pays off. Yes. Yeah. Let's talk, please, because this has got it. Let's talk spam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my number one is Pit and the Pendulum from 61. Um, I, I like everything about this. It's got great atmosphere. It's creepy as all hell. Uh, you know, again, I mentioned earlier this whole thing of betrayal, and I, I don't want to give too much of the plot away for people who haven't seen the film, but uh, you got some great actors in here. You got Vincent Price, you got Barbara Steele plays the wife, right? who uh you know everybody assumes is dead and that's part of the whole story here and then you've got uh, you know vincent price he's got this family history of torture and that's why he's living in this house with all this crap in the basement right uh you've got uh the family physician played by anthony carboni who's great and he's like a slimy scumbag in this film uh I, you know i don't i don't want to give too much away it also starts john kerr and luana andrews uh, it, it's just a terrific film. It, it's a great performance by Price because he's just unraveling as the film goes on. And that, that's what's so great. It's, it's great seeing him in this kind of a role like this where he's just like, he's just totally going freaking bonkers the, the, the further on you get into the movie. And in the end, it turns out that he was, well, I don't want to say it, but uh, I'll leave it at that. But uh, so that's my number one. And we probably should miss, so we, neither one of us have mentioned uh, The Raven which uh where is my raven here which i i view that as harry potter in a nursing home uh yeah. but it's you know the raven is wizards 
yeah, it's it's a blast. I part of me almost wanted to put it in my top five because it's so much fun, but it's like, but it's a different type of film. It's basically a horror comedy. And again, you've got Vincent Price and Peter Laurie and Boris Karloff, all as like rival sorcerers. And it's it's a blast. It's funny, it's cool, it's got pretty decent effects, I think, for a movie from 1963. Uh, but you know, it's not, it's not scary at all. It's not chilling or anything like that, but it's really, if you want to see these three guys working together and probably having a blast together and it, it's, it's a lot of fun and, uh, kind of cool to see Karloff in, in a film like this, I think. Well, it, it's even film. It's, unfortunately, it's not a, it's, it's not a, a, uh, Corbin film, but once again, to watch these guys have fun with each other. Uh, I think it was a comedy of terrors. Is that the one? Uh, right, right, comedy right. of terrors. Which is which is not a Corman film, although it's a it's and it was you know it's it's Laurie, Karloff, Price, and they all seem to be having a blast with this, you know. And it's once again anthology series. They even have Joey Brown, the comedian from the thirties, with the big mouth, and it's 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 a lot of fun. And they plan on doing some other like anthologies with these five together. But by the time they got around to do them, like two of them were dead. So. Yeah. We lost half our cast. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about it is that is with um, with um, American International Pictures when they uh, when Corman and them Corman still stayed around for a while, but they no longer did Poe films. But American International Pictures milked the Poe name so hard. I mean, the con um, the Witchfinder General with Bar um, Vincent Price once again was released in England as the Witchfinder General. When it was released here, it was called The Conqueror Worm, yeah. which is based on an Edgar Allan Poe poem, in which, how do they validate it? They hired Price, I think, for one day to do like a thriller narration and read the poem in the beginning of the film, in the American print. And that's how they validate it. Then they brought another film called The Oblong Box. Yeah, that's a good film. But that, sadly enough, um, that plays out more like an amicus film. Um, you know, and that's Vincent Price with Christopher Lee. But it's I started watching that just for the heck of it to get the idea of what was going on with everything, and it's I had a hard time. Really, I like the album. Well. Box. Yeah, I, I dig the album. Box. I, I like it. It, was, it. it just didn't fit into the to the core. No, it doesn't fit into this narrative. No, it doesn't. But uh, yeah, and I do want to mention too before we go, uh, the Raven also in, uh, features uh, Hazel Court once again, and a very very young Jack Nicholson who I will say is pretty terrible in this movie. He's, you know, it, it's a comedy movie anyway. It's a comedy based on some post stuff, but it's just, it's, uh, Jack is so bad. I mean, this has got to be one of his first roles, I think. It's amazing how someone can turn into it, an Oscar winner in such a short period of time. But if you watch Jack Nicholson in The Raven, it's just like, oh, he's just, every scene that he's in, I cringe. But the the other three guys, you know, watching him work together is great. So, uh, yeah. And and the residue of The Raven, the residue of The Raven is the movie The Terror. Yeah. Because what it was, apparently, like, number one, uh, they had two days left to, to use Karloff. Of course, now Karloff is like, he has emphysema. He's wearing like leg braces. So yes. Corman has him running around the castle sets from the Raven. And as he said, he says, we stayed one day ahead of the, of the demolition crew because they're tearing the sets down and they're filming. And then they finished that. And then they contacted Jack Nicholson again and uh, Dick Miller. And they filmed some scenes. And the terror took uh, like nine months to finish. And it ended up becoming like this this bastardized Frankenstein creation of Roger Corman. But once again, it's got its charm. You know, it's, 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 how can you do this? Francis Ford Coppola had his hands in a lot of these, a lot of these films, either doing dialogue or helping edit uh, behind the scenes because he started, you know, with Corman. And, all, and many people uh, started with Corman. But yeah, and the last one I think we didn't mention is Tomb of Legia, which I find is an extremely slow moving, God. And, you know, once again, Vincent Price is in it. It was filmed in England on one of those deals with the tax breaks. But the only reason Vincent Price is in the film is because since uh, Arkoff and Nicholson yeah, were partial producers on this film, they wanted to have Vincent Price cast. 
to be able to take advantage once again of the Vincent Price name on the marquee and also tying it in with the Pope. But the role was made for a much younger man. And as Roger Corman says, he says he was even against having Vincent Price play the role. It should have been played by a much younger man. I mean, maybe like a Michael York at that time or Johnny Depp when he was, you know, maybe in doing Sleepy Hollow, that type of thing. And he says, well, we got a makeup person who happened to be kind of like, I don't know, something along the lines of Marlena Dietrich's makeup artist or somebody that worked for like Gloria Swanson on Sunset Boulevard. And he goes, <laughs> he goes we tried to make him look like he was like 30. But he was like in actuality, like almost 60. I know. Was. Yeah. And you got this very young actress, and, Elizabeth Shepard, who sees, you know, Vincent Price's character. He's mourning over the death of his wife. And she's yeah. like, oh, God, he's a, I got to meet him. Old. I'm like, what? He's a hot old fart. I know what You know, I know. So, um, oh, too funny. Well, but yeah, it's I, I mean, it's OK. It's it's easily one of the well. weakest of this whole series, I think, for me. But, um, you know whatever so there you have it everybody uh our ranking of the uh roger corman vincent price adaptations edgar Allan poe uh some fun stuff here if you haven't seen any of these films i highly recommend it like i said you can get a good chunk of them on this uh vincent price collection number two there's three of them in total there if you love vincent price you got to have all three of them but uh, you know many of the really really strong ones are on this or I, like dan was showing there's those arrow sets which are really good as well which is a good thing about the arrows they're, they're region two but they're oh those are the region two. Well, you have a region free yeah, player if not, if not scream factory go for the price collections uh here's two of the three of them right here they're all worth getting. Uh, pretty sure they're all still available. I know one. Number one is pricey as heck. That's probably the one. Yeah. So that's uh, that's this one right here. So the, and this this is the one we're talking about. This is that's it. Yeah, yeah. That's that 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 was that came out. I think they may have repressed it. I'm not sure. But for a while, it was fetching a very 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 heavy price. Yeah. Because out of print. But it's a great those those three volumes. You pretty much have every, everything you need uh, from. Uh, Vincent Price. Yeah. I mean, this one here has got Pit in the Pendulum, Mask of the Red Death, Haunted Palace, House of Usher, Abominable Dr. Fives, and Witchfinder General. I mean, right there, you got to have that. This one here has got The Raven, Comedy of Terrors, Tomb of Ligia, Last Man on Earth, Dr. Fives Rises Again, Return of the Fly, and House on Haunted Hill. And the third's got great stuff too. So yeah, I mean, it's, if, you want, if you want a Vincent Price collection, those are the three things you need to get. So, and then, you know, you got Stop shopping. Please yeah. Stop. And then uh, the, uh, Kino Lorber did the premature burial, which is also worth having. So speaking of Kino Lorber, wow, is that a great segue. So stay tuned for next week. Uh, Dan and I will be back once again here on the Monsters Den talking about five really cool Kino Lorber. Um, before I forget, uh, they also did the Tales of Terror as well. Um, we're going to be talking about five really cool new uh, Kino Lorber Blu-ray releases of uh, five kind of little known semi-classics from the 30s and 40s, kind of a horror, mystery, thriller, melodrama type of thing. So we'll be talking about those, kind of reviewing those on next week's show. So stay tuned for that if you like some of the old stuff. And uh, visit us on the web at www.seetranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, of course, we're here on YouTube all the damn time. For Dan Brown, I am Pete Pardo. Thanks for watching the Mar Monsters Den. See you tomorrow morning. Martin Popoff and I back at the Fun House. We've got Saturday. Saturday is the UK Connection, Sunday album homework assignment, then of course the week starts all over again with the Hudson Valley Squares on Monday, but till next Thursday, see you later from the Monsters Den. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.